gentlemen. Thank you. Gee, you are well trained. Thank you. <laughs> Firstly, uh, thank you very much for being with us. My name is Michael Howe. Uh, I'm the uh, president. And I'd like to just very, very briefly, before getting to our guest speaker, pay our respects, make some acknowledgements, um, ask you for your help on a couple of, of issues, and then, of course, the main event. Uh, firstly, I'd like to pay our respects. We pay respects to our elders, past and present. We extend that respect to all Aboriginal people of this land. We acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather, the Gadigal of the Aora people. And we're on land that was ceded or sold, but always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Could I just uh, make a couple of acknowledgements and thank yous? And a couple that are not on the slide, because it's a great pleasure to have them, uh, but I didn't get a chance to put them on the slide. So, firstly, could I just acknowledge, but he will be introduced properly, uh, a good friend, a colleague and our guest speaker today, Commodore Chris Smallhorn. Chris, thanks for being with us. Could I then just very quickly say that we've got a, another good friend of mine, Terry Hetherington. Identify yourself, Terry, so people can chat later if they had to. Terry has not long retired as the director of the Fleet Air Arm Museum, and so uh, if you've not been there, there I'll put a fleet free plug in for, for the Fleet Air Arm Museum, but uh, a very significant collection. And Terry, thanks for coming up. Terry's come from Nara today to... Um, probably hold a score up the back, Chris, but uh, <laughs> equivalent. We have apologies from our vice patrons who specifically apologised that they couldn't come today, but I'm delighted to say that Major General Kath Campbell has nominated, and he is able to be with us, um, Colonel Chris Buxton. Chris, thank you very much for being here today, and I just wanted to acknowledge your presence and, the, and your time. Thank you. And uh, Chris is representing the commander of 2nd Division today. And uh, Fred Niles slipped, uh, slipped in. Fred, it's a pleasure to see you and thank you for your support. And uh, a wise choice between this and Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> so could I thank you and acknowledge your presence for being with us today. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, just move very quickly through... For those of you who have not been following or perhaps are here for the first time, we've been trying to follow a theme, and it is improving resilience. And if you look back, this is the journey that we've had so far. In January, we had a futurist saying, well, maybe what's happening and what should we be resilient about if it happens? In February, we had the South Coast Disaster Coordinator, Vince De Pietro, talking to us about what have we learned about resilience from the South Coast disaster fires? In March, we had, by Zoom webcast, uh, Andy Robertson, who's also a Commodore Reserve in the Navy, but he was the Chief Medical <coughs> Officer guiding or giving advice on dealing with COVID in Western Australia. And could I commend those presentations to you because they are surprisingly useful from a leadership point of view. But the one that I just thought, oh gee, I'm glad I came to that, uh, was uh, Shane Fitzsimmons. And if you haven't had a chance, could I commend to you that webcast, and if you are short of time, look at the last 15 minutes. Because, uh, boy, did he pull it together, and uh, I think it's pretty easy to understand why a lot of people believe in and follow and, and are, are influenced by Shane. If you have not had chance, the left box says, please come and visit us. Uh, we have an excellent library of national significance. And if you've not seen the special RAAF 100th commemorative book that was laid up here at the uh, RAF 100th ceremony about six weeks ago now, uh, a magnificent tribute to all of the RAF personnel who were killed in World War II in service. If you look at the middle request, if you haven't been around the new extension to the Anzac Memorial, could I commend your time to look at it? It is truly moving and it's also a very nice tribute, but remember the focus here is New South Wales service, whereas the focus of the Australian War Memorial is national service, meaning service across Australia. And finally, as you would expect, we'd love to get your help if you can give us some assistance. We need help with keeping the library open. 
we need help with etc, etc, etc. Could I identify over in my right, your left, Greg Stevenson. Uh, Greg is one of our RUSI senior volunteers who assist with uh, sorting and putting books into either into our library or making them available for sale. Uh, Coromel RSL sub-branch just donated its library to us and we are sorting through at the moment an extensive collection of military well, books or related books. Some of them have appeared for the first time today. I don't think I'm going to earn a living in sales and marketing, but I'm doing my best. Well, I'd like to just again acknowledge and ask our lecture coordinator, Colonel Ken Broadhead, if he would introduce Chris, and it's my great pleasure to hand over to Ken and ask him to introduce our distinguished speaker today. Thanks, Ken. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm truly honoured to welcome our guest today, Commodore Chris Smallhorn, RIN retired. His subject is extraordinarily challenging. Australian sovereign capacities and resilience in crisis and disaster, a defence and industry partnership. Uh, I think very few people would have the breadth and experience to address that subject adequately, but there is no doubt that today's speaker has all the attributes necessary. He was born and received secondary education in Toowoomba, another who supports my theory that regional Australia provides more than their share of those who join the Navy. He graduated from the Australian Defence Force Academy. You must have been one of the very first intakes. In fact, the second intake of all three. Right. And uh, has a, uh, went then, then qualified at the Royal uh, Melbourne Institute of Technology with a Bachelor of Aerospace Engineering and received his pilot's wings in 1993. He conducted operational deployments flying Seahawk helicopter. He was selected for experimental test pilot training in the US. Uh, he was then posted to the uh, Navy's Aircraft Maintenance and Flight Trials Unit. He was the officer in charge uh, of that in 2003 before being promoted commander. He became project manager of Super Sea Sprite Acquisition. He commanded 816 Squadron Seahawk helicopters throughout 2008 and 9. He was Commander of Operational Airworthiness and Standards at Headquarters Fleet Air Arm. Uh, then Chief of Staff, Fleet Air Arm and Chief of Staff to the Chief of Navy. He assumed duties as Director of the Maritime Safety Bureau in early 2015. He became Commander Fleet Air Arm in early 2016, followed by post in Canberra in contestability. Uh, where he reviewed equipment for the, for the Royal Australian Air Force and the Army, obviously with classic naval objectivity. Absolutely. He's the Director of Safe Skies Australia, which delivers an international conference on Australia um, in Australia. He supports various not-for-profit emergency medical and search and rescue organisations and he's flown their aircraft for years on weekends and leave, thus maintaining his flying currency. He and Associate Professor Captain Atkinson created a unique systems innovation course with the University of Sydney Executive Business School. This has been running for three years and has over 100 graduates. He became Chief Executive Officer of Colston, Colson Aviation Australia in September last year. Colson Aviation Australia operates the only aerial firefighting service in the world with both fixed and rotary wing aircraft. It has Boeing 737 uh, Fireliners, uh, C-130 Hercules Fire Bombers, Chinooks, Blackhawks and Sikorsky. And they can run rapid air attack aerial fire suppression. To share with us his clearly well-founded insights into this subject, please welcome Commodore Chris Smallhorn. While, uh, while Michael's doing the, uh, the magic there, uh, first of all, for our, uh, our patron, Kath, and Chris, not to, nice to have you. Kath's a great, uh, great colleague, classmate, and we worked a lot together over the last couple of years, so please pass my regards. Um, professor Howe, it's funny, if, if, if anyone can do marketing, I would think the former professor of business at the University of Wollongong would probably be able to do that. If you can't, none of us can. 
And Ken, thank you for a, uh, a wonderful introduction. Uh, I think you overstated a great many things, and, uh, but it was, uh, it's certainly been a, a wonderful career. And I look at the previous speakers that we've had, and I, I have to say, um, uh, I'm wondering how I ended up here, but let's just say it looks like you've got, the, you've got Shane first, and then you've got me. Uh, living up to a Shane Fitzsimmons speech, well, I'll tell you, I had some tough gigs, but today has got to be one of the, uh, one of the tougher ones. Um, it is, as I say, an enormous honour to come and speak here. This institution formed in England in 1831 at Apsley House and then here uh, in Australia in 1888. And its, its breadth of intent and scope is extraordinary. And that is to promote the understanding of defence and national security in doing that since 1988. Well, that pretty well covers a whole lot of stuff. And what national security and national resilience looks like is arguably or unarguably changing as the uh, as the years move on, as has always been the case uh, as the as the world has has evolved. Um, I hope today, whether it be uh, uh, following the speech and in a few uh, conversations around Q and A, or even afterwards, that we debate and challenge. It's important that an institution that finds itself uh, and founds itself as a think tank challenges each other at all times. It is how the national debate happens. It is how we continuously improve as a nation. And as a result, I come back to where I started. I'm very honoured to be here and in my small way contribute to that ongoing debate and one that's now been going for a great many years. So I just want to quickly talk about the lens of resilience. What is, what, what is the lens of resilience? Well, there's a lot of lenses we can look through. We'll only look through a couple today. Um, clearly, the safety of every Australian, if there's, uh, not, if there's uh, certainly one lens to look through, then the health of Australians has one that has become extremely important in the past year as we have navigated the COVID uh, crises pandemic here in Australia. Economic resilience, environmental resilience, security, military resilience, diplomatic, information and cyber, some of those new challenges that we have to deal with as the, uh, as the years move on. Which, which leads to a conversation of what is sovereignty and what is sovereign capability, the, 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 the topics of... We often think about this, particularly in a military institution. Don't worry, it's not lost on me that I'm a little underdone. There's a few more army in this room. There are navy. I'm a little bit happy to see just a couple of navy there to give me some moral support and one or two raffies. But, uh, uh, but from a sovereign capability perspective, well, what, what is sovereign capability? Defence defined it uh, some years ago, and they called it the ability to design maintain, sustain, enhance and develop capabilities in Australia. But I'd add to that, it's also the ability to employ, to coordinate, to appropriately integrate that capability in the interests of Australia, its states, its territories and its allies. All of these things, having the capability is the beginning, it's the employment of capability which is the end game. And I use the term appropriately integrate, we can sometimes over integrate. In my previous roles in defence we've worked extremely hard to find high levels of integration and that is important and that is important and it, it becomes uh, a leverage point for us to win in the various complex theatres that we operate. But at the same time, one can over-integrate as well. Good coordination and communication is a form of integration. We need to do that across our country. We often think of sovereignty at a federal level only. And while the topic of my speech is about a defence industry partnership, I'd ask that as we talk through this today, we think about defence more broadly, and that is the sovereign governments of Australia and the, so and the sovereign capabilities that all of our departments bring to the game in terms of national resilience. I'd say that sovereignty and resilience is built upon the sum of our parts. It's on all of our states, it's our territories, it's our industry. It's the federal model and the federal assets under which we operate and under which we as a country tick along every day. Resilience, if for those who've already seen Shane's speech uh, last time round, last month, was uh, he, he suggested uh, a line, our ability to withstand shock uh, and bounce back better and stronger. I, I couldn't agree more. It's not, it, resilience often thought about just that ability to, to survive and therefore to move on with what you're doing. It's more than that. If we're to continuously improve and become better as a federation of states and as a nation, it is also our ability to be stronger. One is never judged by what we do when things are going wrong, going right, but we're always judged by what we do when things are going wrong. And so is the case at, at a whole of national level. We should see every one of our crises and every one of our challenges as an opportunity to be better, not something to be scared of, not something to be frightened of, something to improve all that we do at that coordination, communication and integrated level. 
So let's, let's reflect uh, just a little about the different things that are going on. Now, whilst the topic of my discussion is not going to be about geopolitics, the picture that you see there is the economic tracks, the maritime uh, lines of communication tracks around Australia. These, this is our economic uh, lifeline. This is where the blood of the country pours. Uh, and if you have a look at that, the darker the colour, so the reds, is the higher amount of traffic and the greens is the lighter amount of traffic and obviously the yellows um, in between. And as you can see, we, we seem to have a great reliance on a couple of areas. And if you think of where we are militarily um, displaced or projecting, it just happens to align with some of those darker areas. There's no magic to that. That's what a national strategy, albeit that we as a country don't have so much as a published one, this is what national strategy looks like. This is a form of resilience. This is how the country keeps ticking along. Now, what's not on that map is, of course, what goes under the sea. And uh, whilst I did spend a great deal of my, uh, my career hunting submarines and found great joy in it, although if there's any submarines in the room, if, if I'd be brutally honest, it was pretty damn tough to find you. Um, but the, but the, the fact of the matter is there is also a lot of our information that flows along the sea floor. And the cables is yet another vulnerability for our nation. But our sea, our maritime, and the security of our maritime trajectories and sea lines of communication are the lifebloods of our nation. And so geopolitics, that is a lens. Are we facing some challenging times ahead? Well, again, not so much the topic, and indeed probably a lunchtime, lunchtime lecture in and of itself, uh, absolutely we are. As we watch the South China Sea develop into a place of challenge, the Western Pacific becoming a place of competition, the Indian Ocean and of course the Middle East as we try and manage all of these uh, different, uh, different challenges uh, worldwide. Uh, we only need to look as recently as the Israeli uh, con conflict and the fact that we now have uh, the Europeans and the British projecting into the South China Sea. Uh, there are challenges for us all as a group of nations as we find uh, safety, security and the rule of law on the high seas, which feeds our nation. But of course, in 2019-2020, uh, we saw some fires. I would be surprised if there is one person in the room that either wasn't personally touched or had family or close friends that were personally touched by uh, those devastating fires. It's cyclic here in Australia, 2008-9, uh, 2003, 2015-16. This was a, particular, a particularly large one, of course, that affected us all. I remember on New Year's Day going down and feeling somewhat guilty as I uh, was seeing this developing in 2019 and uh, seeing the fires developing broadly across the state uh, and states uh, uh, plurally. And I went down to Nara just to go and uh, buy the goodies for the, uh, for the, the, the evening at home. Uh, and was watching a, a, a wave of cloud pour across uh, from the south and start to uh, envelope uh, Nara and its surrounds. And it was, um, it was extraordinary. It was a sight I can't say that I'd, uh, I'd ever seen before. Uh, there is no doubt that this is a, a crisis that demanded the best of our resilience. The COVID pandemic, uh, the great sight of our health providers that have been the true heroes of the last uh, year, year and a half, uh, something that we will continue to live with, no doubt, for many years to come. And then we turn around and, of course, we have um, floods uh, only in February, March uh, this year. Uh, with uh, extraordinary amounts of water falling up in the, uh, in the north of our state. But yet, the question we could ask ourselves is, are we resilient? Well, here we are on the tail end, or shall we say, on the manageable end of a pandemic, at least as we sit here today, with floods only a short time in our wake, with fires a year and a half in our wake, and as I'm sure you heard from Vince Di Pietro, a great deal of rebuilding still uh, underway. But yet this year, uh, the uh, Reserve Bank of Australia projects a 3.5% increase in our GDP. We're projecting a uh, reduction of our of unemployment rates to only 5.25%, getting back to figures that were pre-pandemic figures. It is impressive by any measure that we as a nation have managed to endure this. So I would say there is a resilience, a strong resilience within our nation. And are we bouncing back better? Perhaps, let us hope so. And I personally am a glass half full and would say, I think so. But that doesn't mean that there's not more that we can do. The SAR region that our nation needs to cover is that very large box uh, down at the bottom there. And uh, that covers 10% of the globe, 
and 53 million square kilometres. So when we start to look, it's, it is of course the resilience of our nation, but also our surrounds and how we can project and support those areas. Uh, I've shown this particular picture in, uh, in numerous places over the years, and uh, it's not surprising how few Australians un, uh, see this picture because generally it's only the people that operate in the business that need to know it. But it is extraordinary that a country of 25 million odd people are responsible for the search and rescue response to 10% of the globe. It speaks volumes of what we are capable of and what we do and what the world asks of us. We should be very proud of that. But as we start looking at some of the crises as we look into the future, potential natural disasters and steering a little bit away now from just the geopolitical side, concentrating more on those middle three slides and the, the, the issues that we have managed over the last year and a half coming on uh, two years. Here's just some figures for you to, to, to pop in your back pocket when we talk about uh, what does resilience mean for us and bouncing back better and stronger. The fire seasons of 8, 9, of 15, 16, 19, 20. Uh, 24 million hectares in environmental damage. Now, I seem to recall in Shane's lecture, he may have mentioned 35 million. I am inclined to believe the commissioner of the RFS of the day. This just happens to come out of the Royal Commission's uh, report, these figures. $4.5 billion in insured losses. That exceeds the cost of running our defence force on an annual basis. Uh, it, it is a figure that I do not personally believe is actually advertised sufficiently around the country at just what is the true cost of these disasters. An estimated three million animals died in just the 1920 fires alone. But what do we look at for natural disasters more broadly? Right now, on average, it's costing us $18.2 billion a year with a projected $39 billion per year by 2050, not accounting for what climatic change may or may not do over the decades to come. These are, these are ex extraordinary figures when you start to think of what does resilience in the natural, and natural uh, crises, or should I say disaster space, uh, mean, mean to us. The picture down the bottom is to give you a sense of actually what is our disaster season here in, here in Australia. Um, and it actually goes from uh, July all the way through to May, and it's because our country covers everything from the subtropical to the arid uh, and then down to the further south of, of our country. And what you're seeing there is as you start looking at when the disasters strike, it crosses uh, across the states and therefore the mobility of our responses, just like the Defence Forces mobile, so too does industry, so too do the states and the territories and their, and their departments need to be equally mobile to be able to work collectively together to bring together a sovereign capability to respond to something that is not a question of what will it be, this is what it is today. We are currently in some of our disaster spaces, and I will reflect on aerial firefighting a couple of times here, including some pictures uh, moving on. We are in that particular space still rely heavily on overseas assets for the singular reason that the industry doesn't exist here in Australia yet when we start thinking about very large air tankers and large air tankers that are whilst they are reactive and not necessarily a proactive response, there is plenty we can do in the proactive space as well, but as a reactive response, at the moment, this nation has won. And, and I would applaud quite publicly here the decision made by the New South Wales government uh, on all of our behalves for those of us who are taxpayers in New South Wales to invest in assets like that to build their own fleet capability, which yes, it's a New South Wales capability, but as we demonstrated in the fires in uh, only February this year over in Western Australia, from a tasking in the morning upon uh, the Commissioner of the RFS here in New South Wales, contacting the Commissioner of Emergency Services in uh, Western Australia, can we help? And the answer was, uh, yes, you can. That tasking resulted in a 737 Fireliner and a Cessna jet um, bird dog or lead aircraft. So some of our um, Vietnam veterans here will know that uh, where the bird dog term comes from, we've kept it. Uh, and, uh, and those aircraft deployed in one day across the continent and were fighting fires before sunset in, in Western Australia. That's a sovereign capability in, in my view, and it comes from those um, uh, rather courageous decisions, in this case by a singular, a singular state. So the, the cost is significant. I'd like to just quickly do, however, uh, just a short case study with you. Sovereign assets in our nation are many and varied. This one I'm just going to talk about Port Hedland. Port Hedland up in the northwest of the, uh, of the country. So Port Hedland has a, as its GDP contribution, now these figures come from 2018 and 2019, 4.6% of the nation's GDP was earned in Port Hedland alone. 
Uh, that works out to about 0.1% uh, per week. The figures, uh, just for those who uh, are into the economics of it, is $64 billion in a fiscal year of 1819, measured against a national GDP of $1,392 billion. It's a significant um, figure. 130,000 full-time equivalent jobs in the country rely on the primary and secondary industries and flow-on logistic industries that come from Port Hedland alone. $4 billion in taxes. One in 12 jobs in Western Australia. Western Australia is 33% of our nation and 12% of our population. Uh, so therefore one of the lowest tax bases in the country with the biggest piece of land mass, relying heavily on Port Hedland for its ongoing uh, survival or shall we say economic um, successes. If that gets struck by, uh, by natural disaster and we lose a week, we lose significant GDP. 0.1% of GDP is not a small amount. But for the want of the necessary sovereign capabilities, the ability to project those capabilities um, on a timely fashion, and sometimes, as I spoke to uh, the Commissioner of Emergency Services in Western Australia, he said to me, Chris, sometimes turning these places back on is but for want of a generator. Uh, he said, but when you've got to cover the land masses that we've got to cover, you truck a generator, it's there in three days. If I could fly a generator, it's there in, in hours. That can be the difference between getting these capabilities turned on and turned off. Our ability to respond as a nation with the collective and coordinated and integrated capabilities is our ability to turn these things uh, back on. All that you'll see here is a series of pictures so that if by now I've just about shut you down, then you can revert to the pictures and there's lots of great shots that will just go on and talk about some of the different things that happen in Australia. The coordinate efforts between industry, departments and between the Defence Force as they have responded to different national disasters over the past couple of years here in Australia. But while I do that, I'll talk a little bit more about what is the capabilities that exist to deal with these crises and natural disasters in Australia. So volunteerism in Australia is pretty strong. In terms of firefighters, there's 152,000 volunteers in, in Australia. Some of them are in this room. Uh, there is, in fire and rescue, just New South Wales alone to get a sense of size, 6,840 people. That's the third biggest fire and rescue service in the world. So we here, here in New South Wales, because it covers the breadth of a state rather than just a city, it's, it's a very large fire and rescue service. The total number of professional firefighters is 20,700. Put all that together, we have around about 173,500 and change uh, people in the country dedicated to fire and rescue services. There's over 80,000 full-time emergency services personnel. The Department of Defence has 85,000 people. Bring all of this together and there is a significant sovereign capability in which we do and do well in many of our ability to respond. Industry has been defined by the Defence Force as a fundamental input to capability and so it is for natural disasters and crises response. Uh, industry, I, 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 will, uh, I would have to be um, reminded because I don't remember the year, but it's probably at least five or six years ago that industry was actually included into the FIC list and it was very welcome to the Defence Force to recognise just how important to national security was industry. So is the case in all the rest of our resilience lenses, is our ability to use industry well. And if there's one thing, the transition from a long career in the military to a, to date, a short career in the services has told me is the level of understanding on the way these capabilities can actually integrate, not just in a provision, sustainment, acquisition lens, but through an operational lens, command and control lens, how these things can actually contribute are greater but it takes that understanding of the two parties. I think we've well grasped in the, in the acquisition sector how we can use um, our industry. Uh, you would have heard uh, that I was um, the, uh, the project manager of the Sea Sprite, was probably not the most glorious posting I'd had in my life for those who know that particular one, but that is just another lunchtime lecture uh, that we could, uh, we could talk about. However, sovereign industrial capability has in the last few years become a much stronger language in the defence sector and I am uh, really pleased to hear it and certainly was amongst some wonderful peers, friends, seniors and juniors who were pushing to build that narrative into the Australian Defence Force and wider defence sector um, vernacular. 
Yes, a lot of these technologies do need, in some instances, to come from overseas. We have our expertises, we have our specialisations here in Australia of that, there is no doubt. But when we do bring these things in from overseas, one of those places, those vegetables that can hold the knowledge, transfer the knowledge, how do we transfer that into Australia? Industry is one of those areas, Defence Department, states and territories and their government departments are those areas that can hold that knowledge. But having a deliberate approach to the way we build sovereign industry capability and the transfer of knowledge in the various sectors of industry that we see that we need to build to build resilience is, I believe, the golden nugget in how we truly build a strong sovereign industrial capability uh, throughout our country. Equal to this is federalism. Now, in many of the sectors uh, or parts of the emergency services that I have uh, now had just the, the great honour to, to work across in the last year uh, throughout Australia, often I hear that federalism is one of our barriers to success. Well, well my own conclusion is it's our greatest opportunity. Um, federalism is number one part of our constitution. There, it's not changing and, uh, and, and I for one would, would not want to see such collective change as that. But constructive and cooperative federalism is a force multiplier of extraordinary proportions. We saw this at the, uh, as we immediately responded as a nation to COVID with the National Security Council broadening its, um, its mandate or inclusion of, um, of the states and how powerful that was as a nation. Uh, I see cooperative and coordinated and constructive federalism happening just as we did in the fires in, uh, in uh, Western Australia that I mentioned earlier on. The, the, the cornerstone of the success will be uh, and is how do we build that strong connectivity and sinews between the states standing protocols in the way that they can communicate to build that coordinated C2 command and control structure. Industry has no borders and industry can work across uh, that cooperative and constructive federalism. Uh, and again, I, uh, I wish that this epiphany had arrived a little earlier for me during my defence career to know how to capitalise in it more. Uh, I did have some wonderful opportunities early in my career, as, uh, particularly as a test pilot embedded in companies doing aircraft um, development work. Uh, and, and even then, I didn't quite appreciate the power of it. The sovereign industrial capability labelling within Defence Force is starting to grasp the power of it, but industry has no borders. Um, yes, our sovereign knowledge needs to be protected, but our ability to knowledge transfer across borders, across nations, across states is very powerful. And so industry is a lever point that can bring the strength of cooperative, coordinated, constructive um, uh, federalism. The mechanics, of course, is building a strong C2 or C4 protocol as we move more into the coordination computing um, spaces. And being able to embrace technology will demand that those integrated management systems are developed strongly and deliberately as we work through. And some of that area we are, we are working on right now. And because I've wisely kept on top of my timing, this is, a, uh, is something that most military people in the room won't be unfamiliar with. It's just another lightning diagram. Uh, as I used to hear, all so often working in the, uh, the complex defence industry space. But what we're seeing now is the ability to access this sort of technology, which was previously the purview of only the military and those who could afford it and the very big companies, has changed. And uh, I, I've been... I've been really excited as I've watched in the space at how rapidly that industry, when not encumbered by some of the barriers that are put in place in large defence contracts, are able to move with this technology. The ability to access mesh networks, high-end uh, radios, yes, military grade, but don't need to worry about all of the encryption. The coordination that that brings in having a common protocol of business across the country is a lever point, a little like our cooperative federalism, that we can build upon and find strength from. And this is certainly an area that I hear a lot of conversation for uh, around the country and certainly a space that we are seeking to work within. Um, some of the names even on this diagram are very military orientated, but of course they are entirely applicable to the natural disaster space. And here we get to the heart of how we coordinate the various sovereign capabilities across our federal, state, 
territories and industry, building once exactly as the military have done in the years gone by, common protocol link communication uh, networks. Certainly any of our army colleagues who worked here in Signals, this will be very common language to you and something that, as, uh, that all of our services have built upon. But it's cost our nation a lot of gold. It makes sense for us to take that knowledge and transfer it into these other sectors and these other spaces. <coughs> Um, including the, the, the embracing of, uh, of the, the tr not just terrestrially based but certainly space based uh, technologies and I'm uh, in encouraged as I see some of the conversations I get pulled into with our large uh, contractors to defence at how they are also working hard to come into this space including some really fascinating concepts of airships uh, again coming and doing some of, uh, some of this, this sort of work. It's exciting to see where this might turn up. But a quick return just to the geopolitics. The, once a sovereign capability is built, once the sovereign capability coordinates and, uh, and, and communicates in a fashion on a common protocol basis and integrated management system, you also get to, get to start leverage on where do we want to use those capabilities at any given time. Certainly nationally, it's our ability to bring them to the threat at any given time and, rap and do that in a, in a rapid sense. The soft power capabilities that defence does for us uh, in working out throughout our regions with our allies and our friends is extraordinary. And the, the value that we get from sending our defence force abroad in times of disaster and crisis, I think we all appreciate, is powerful. However, uh, what is often challenging for us is to maintain and sustain the footprint there. Our urban search and rescue teams from Victoria, from, um, uh, from New South Wales and Queensland and Western Australia have been used in various uh, crises around the world, including in the nuclear crises in Japan and also in the, um, uh, the um, earthquake events over in New Zealand. Deploying those capabilities gives us that sustainment. It can stay on site. So too does a coordinated partnership between defence, the states and industry. The ability to look at the collective assets of the nation, no matter who owns and no matter where they sit, and bring them together as a coordinated joint force that supplements and, and sustains the capability after the defence force has been able to come in and do that initial response, that initial reaction. Again, the broader partnership, it buys the leverage that comes with that 240-odd thousand people that are working in the natural disasters and crises response um, sectors. We have a point in history which maybe we will lever on. Uh, the devastating events that I spoke to earlier have all created a community awareness at this time which is probably as heightened, I think, as most of us may well have seen in our lifetime apart from time of war. The Royal Commission has engaged the community, it has given a roadmap and a path, and there I speak specifically of the Royal Commission to the fire events of 1819. Uh, However, a lot of the conclusions there are broader in emergency management at a national level, and some of those actions are already being taken. Economic pressures on industries such as, and you'll forgive me for a short focus on the aviation industry, the economic pressures on the aviation industry is uh, well established. Um, the workforce movement, Commissioner Paul Baxter of the Fire and Rescue New South Wales sent me some pictures a couple of weekends ago of his two newest on-call firefighters. They were both A380 pilots. One was a Qantas captain, one was a Qantas first officer. The movement of the workforce of highly skilled people into other highly skilled jobs is a direct response to the downturn in the industry. CapEx, the capital expenditure to bring in some of these major assets today is cheaper than it's been at any time in my career. Whilst again, just a, a folk, there are many different large assets we can talk to here, uh, but one of them, if I was to talk just to um, large aircraft, you can now buy a large airline aircraft for the price of its engines. Our ability as a nation to where we find that we have strengths and weaknesses or we want to build a new sector to support national resilience, our ability to do that from a CapEx perspective, also reflecting on our bounce back on GDP, is there. Can we as a nation capitalise on it? My offering is that with those four pieces lining up in history, it is a unique inflection point. And let us hope that we as a nation will capitalise on those opportunities. I believe we will. If I just wrap up in conclusion, the natural disasters and crises that we talked about earlier, the overlapping seasons, uh, the cost of, uh, of these disasters and the projected costs uh, are are extraordinary and I think they themselves sell on their statistics alone. This is our lived experience today. 
And when you add the, geopolit the geopolitical challenges that we're seeing today, and, 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 and I think that most people who think in that space in this room will see that we have a road ahead of us. Collectively, more challenging environmental issues, more challenging crises, and the geopolitical situation that our nation faces and our, and our friends and allies face in the years to come all collectively paint a picture of challenge for our children. One may ask, are we handing over a better world? And I'll leave that as an open question. But again, always glass half full. We will if we continue to fight for it and never trade our values. The assets and technical divide between the high-end capabilities of the Defence Force and our states and territories and what industry can bring to the game, can bring to the fight, is closing. Our ability to access the high-end technology and our ability to access some of those high-end assets, also with changing spectrums of capital expenditure, gives us opportunity. Um, it is ultimately the safety of the community and it is an inelastic economic outcome. The people of Australia and the number one priority of the government is the safety of the people of Australia. The people of Australia expect that we as a nation are resilient, that we as a nation will bounce back and that we as a nation will be better than when we started the challenge. The defence, industry, states, territories, a strong coordinated partnership with seamless command and control integration and the effective use of the assets is that opportunity space for us. Where we do have differences from state to state, territory to territory, defence plugging into a civil emergency response, civil assets plugging into a defence emergency response. There are rub areas and points that just as our military, as it's come into a more joint force, has had to overcome, the learnt experience is there. We can share that and we could learn from both. This is not for a second to say that the command and control of the manner in which we deal with a lot of our crises at the moment is not good. In fact, I think it is some of the best in the world. World. However, it is to say that with those aforementioned uh, challenges, we need to continuously improve and become stronger in our partnerships uh, across the board. In times of crises and disaster, I guess the defence, the states, the territories, industry partnership coming together is going to be key in terms of also improving our decision making and a space that is very um, that, that is that is foremost post the 1819 fires is the ability to get information to the people. Uh, often people who were literally seeing the fire closing in or engulfing their town were looking at information coming from the authorities that said it was still three kilometres away, but the picture isn't adding up. This uh, loses the trust and faith of the people. These sorts of technologies and, 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 and work that we are right now trialling can get the information from a ISR asset into the hands of mum and dad and children within 20 to 30 minutes. It's, it's a game changer in decision making for the safety of Australians because they often are the ones, we are the ones at our home who need to make that decision about whether we're going to move or whether we're going to stay. Timely information? No. Timely intelligence? Yes. Turning information into intelligence cleared in a timely fashion and disseminated to those who need it will improve ultimate decision making, not just by our joint commanders, but also by mum and dad sitting at home. Um, collectively, I guess, what do we want to do? Well, it's all those things we talked about um, uh, in terms of what is sovereign capability, but it's also the manner in which we employ, we coordinate. We appropriately integrate those capabilities in the interests of Australians and also in the interests of our sovereign resilience. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk on this topic. Uh, you might notice I tend to have a little bit of a passion for it uh, and I do think there is a great deal as a nation that we are going to do and we have done. We should all be very proud of where we are today. We will bounce back stronger. Um, yes, sir. You have to smile, pose. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Paul, Paul Smith. Um, I think you paint a, a right picture mm. of state, federal, and jurisdictional cooperation. It seems that in the last year there have been significant mm. friction points. Mm. To some extent, National Cabinet has delivered some effective outcomes, but that's morphing into something that's going to change as we appear to recover. Yeah. What are the, 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 at the national level the proactive uh, steps that you alluded to earlier that 
that need to be taken to ensure that we are ready for the next catastrophe. That really is the question. Um, is and so thank you. It's a, I think it's an excellent question. It gets to it gets to the heart of some of these matters. Legislation for what the emergency uh, medical uh, sorry uh, EMA Australia, so the Emergency Management Australia is able to do, has gone through Parliament and changed and given certain additional powers. Now that is not in order to direct and control. It is in terms of being able to coordinate. Now how that plays out in practice is something still being developed. It was one of the clear recommendations out of the Royal Commission and, and that one has, uh, has moved forward. I also believe that the manner in which we are looking at collectively addressing research and development changing, so the Cooperative Research Centre for Bushfires and Hazards is being restructured to try and tackle some of these cross-coordination questions. You said I paint a rosy, a rosy picture. There are always points where it's working and there's always points um, where it isn't. In 2003, there were the radio systems being used by some of our emergency services, in this case a, a fire as well, by Victoria couldn't be used by another state. They're on, um, on different frequencies. In 2018 and 19, the same issue exists. Where I see, my, where, I, where I paint the rosy picture is I've now had the, the wonderful honour, and only a week and a half ago I was speaking at the uh, Australasian uh, Fire and Emergency Services Conference, which is all the commissioners of the country, as actually, or should I say it there, um, their pre-dinner. And what I see is a desire to coordinate, which reminds me of the transition the Defence Force made. I suspect Chris was around in a similar time that I was, and remembers... In fact, I suspect a lot of people in the room, had, uh, in their own careers, had, uh, had seen this. How we almost proactively as services tried to do things differently. It was like a badge of honour uh, to say, no, this is the way the Navy does it. Uh, I mean, while I completely agree that, you know, the Air Force spend more time in five-star hotels than they do at work. But, but beyond that, the, we, we, do, we did see, I often thought, proactive measures to almost not be joined. And then we watched the transition. And I can tell you, as just walking out of the Canberra environment and, and former Division Command, that has changed. It started with the right behaviours by the senior ma'ams and sirs of the service saying, we can be better. And that's the energy I'm seeing from our commissioners. I am highly impressed by the men and women who are leading our emergency services across Australia. And if you were sitting around a table with them having a cup of tea or an amber fluid, you would hear in them their desire to get there. So yeah, there's plenty of rub points that aren't as rosy. But where I buy, I guess, the confidence that I'd hope to leave with you today is the intent, the drive and the passion is starting to emanate at the levels just as I saw it during my career in the Defence Force. We're a better Defence Force for it, we'll be a better nation for this. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I was in the Army uh, many years ago. The, the, there was a, a distinction, a distinct difference between the civilians and military. Military didn't have jurisdiction over civilians. Civilians didn't have jurisdiction over the military. None interfered in the affairs of the other. Since then, I've seen from time to time Defence Force get involved in things like the flood rescue or the, or the Navy coming in and rescuing people from stranded on a beach. Yeah. I, I regard those as exceptional things out of the ordinary and not part of the military function. Yeah. Now, in today's integrated mindset, does the military have a civil defence portfolio and is there training? It's a, uh, thanks for the question, Mark, and, and I really like the way that you've put it, but there's two really important parts. Does it have a mandate? and doesn't have training for it, and those are both very important. And I'm sure if we had some of our patrons here, they would talk to the um, force positioning and force preparation for emergency services um, uh, more articulately than I can. Um, on the first, does it have a mandate? I think the Defence Force always did. The Defence Force is funded by the taxpayers of Australia and it is there to respond to the needs of the people of Australia. If we take the reasonable statement, the true statement, that the number one priority of the federal government and all state governments and territories is the safety of the people, the safety of Australians, then they are required to use the assets um, that are in their hands to do that. And I think what we have seen is, coming back to that, um, that, that strong jointness the Defence Forces bring, what has also come with that is a repeatable and consistent 
um, immediate command and control response. We can deploy as a, de as, a, as a defense force a joint headquarters scaled and tailored to size rapidly and it's extremely effective. When, uh, for those of us who've worked or, or visited some of those headquarters and watched them in action, um, yeah, we've got plenty of things to get better, but it is actually quite impressive. So that, that, that I think, is one of those things, it's, it's a little bit like once you're good at something, people ask you to come and do things. Uh, and I think that is one of the reasons why you're seeing uh, the Defence Force being an immediate response. The other part is just down to the, the, the sheer facts of the matter. It's, it's scalability, it's numbers, it's capacity, and the ability of uh, the Defence Force to mobilise rapidly and bring the need to the demand um, is just beyond what most other areas can do. And that, and that really is down to a logistic move, not just the number of people and the equipment that um, the Defence Force brings to the game. My offering is the divide between what the Defence Force does, which I do believe in answer your question, carries a mandate and a responsibility to serve the people, whatever the need may be, then is that the divide between those sorts of high level of mobilisation capabilities, command and control systems can transfer and will in time, in my view, transfer into industry and civil sector responses so that you have got not, you're not just relying on the Defence Force, because in some ways your question also alludes to the reliance we've put on the Defence Force to respond to the, these, these things. Um, it can then start to balance the reliance. And if we were, God forbid, to get into a more sustained conflict in the years going forward, then again, those assets may not always be there to be able to respond to these sorts of things. Um, you'll forgive me, the uh, second part of the, the question... Training. Training. Training um, and the collective training for emergency services um, has become extremely topical, I would say, around about probably... Uh, well again became topical about six to eight years ago and remains so, even to the point of setting up dedicated um, exercises so that we can practice the response. It's, it's, and it's actually one of the things that we don't think about right down in the detail. Um, are we meeting the necessary work health and safety requirements when we ask a sailor who is normally hauling a line on a ship to go and build a shed on a tropical island in the Western Pacific that's been devastated. Um, have they got the training? Are we setting them up for success? So what we found is the answer to that was no. And so the Defence Force has gone on a dedicated path to try and not just develop the training required, but also to exercise it. If there was one thing that kept me awake at night as commander of the fleet air arm and as an aviator by my very nature nothing keeps me awake at night then it was um, responding to uh, search and rescues because if you wanted our aviators and our maintenance and our wonderful engineers to get out there and go and uh, find a sub or get a weapon on target um, that's bread and butter but if you want them to go and rescue uh, a, a child or, or worst case lift a body from a raging river in the Queensland floods, uh, we don't necessarily prepare them for everything that comes with a search and rescue response. And they are relying on tools in their tool bags that we've given them. Uh, and so often it, well, I found it was those sorts of, emer those sorts of emergency responses that, that kept me alert because I knew we were relying on them putting tools together, not necessarily on a coordinated training package. I hope that helps. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Andrew. Uh, Mark Lennon. Uh, Lee, how are you? Yeah, I've been to the floor, Mike. It's nice to see you. Uh, you met early. The talk was much different from what I expected, and I thought it was great. You mentioned the need for integration, but you also mentioned the need for avoiding over-integration. Yes. Can you flesh that out a little bit more? Yeah, what um, this is... Uh probably comes more from my most recent foray into uh, Canberra, my last posting uh, in the Defence Force. Um, integration is, is a little bit like um, imagery when we first introduced live imagery into an ops room. Uh, and the term I used to use back then was the intoxication of imagery. Once the imagery was there, everyone just looked at it and sometimes at the expense of actually making the right decisions. And I can see Chris has probably experienced that uh, uh, with his, his, his reaction. We've got better uh, at that. Integration, I find, is a little bit the same. We say integration, and therefore the assumption is that everything must integrate with everything. The challenge in that is, number one, expense. It's extraordinarily expensive to... Uh, if, if you want to get to the point that every soldier, sailor, and airman, and every piece of equipment we have is logistically and operationally integrated into the wider system, the, no, no, a couple of things happen. One, the expense to actually achieve it versus the reward you get from it. Do you really need that level of integration at every level? It feels good 
It looks good, but do you actually need it for the expense? The other part is military vulnerability. If um, organisationally everything is on one singular integrated network, you best make sure that you've got a few um, layers in that so that there's a graceful degradation in, uh, in that integration uh, because you don't want to sever one line and then lose all of the pieces on that line. And certainly mesh networks goes to try and help with that in, a, in an operational sense. So it tended to come through those two lenses, um, both uh, vulnerabilities and sustainability of a fully integrated system, but also just the sheer cost. And when we really sat back and said, do those two things absolutely need to talk to each other? Sometimes we said, well, it'd be nice, but it's a bit intoxicating. We don't really need it. There's another way to do it. And, and, and so it really came down to those two questions. That's what I, that's what I meant by it. Second question, who was Colson? Oh, who's Coulson? Yeah, I probably didn't do that bit, did I? So Coulson, uh, Coulson Aviation and the Coulson Group is a Canadian company that have been uh, doing firefighting here since 1999 and doing aviation since the early 90s. It actually started its history as a lumber company. And funny old thing, uh, when there's, uh, if, if the fires come, you lose your lumber. So it seemed like a really good idea to put in protective measures for, for the lumber. Uh, that uh, ultimately resulted in them coming down and working in Australia starting in about 1999 and now it's the company that operates um, the 737 Fireliner, which you would have seen some of the pictures there, the Marie Bashir. Uh, we're also operating a few Cessna Citation jets in Bird Dog and Fire Intelligence. So the picture I showed you of the, uh, the, the, the mesh network, um, we've, we've done the first phase of building that and there's now a, uh, what um, most people in this room would know as a combat management system, an integrated management system installed into, uh, into a Cessna jet that's just about to go into trials um, right now. Yeah, uh, they also, they're right now they're operating over in the USA during the fire season. So they've got lots of aircraft, CH-47s, Hercules, the capability gap between defence and industry closing there when you hear those sorts of names of aircraft. So yeah, that's my thought. Yeah. Now back to Professor Howe. Well folks, it's my pleasure to say thanks to Chris on, on many grounds, but can I just say one thing that really struck me was he didn't talk much about tools and air tankers. <laughs> and, and I thought that was fascinating. And Chris, a couple of things that I would just like to react to. There's sort of yep. Firstly, I was struck by the big picture analysis, which you know you've used at the end, to say, are you aware how much this is costing us? Mm. You know, the, the, those early analyses of insurance costs and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And I wonder if, to me at least, Chris hasn't raised this issue. Is are we really not yet getting some of the legislative and governance things that would enable the kind of solutions that mm. you would have? Because Chris, you probably would know the first person who'd block this would be a defence bureaucrat saying it can't come out of that pot. And when you think about it, and can I draw an analogy, a lot of the problems with health at the moment is that we know that investing in preventative health would actually give big benefits, but most of our health system is, if you like, tied up by people who are invested in reactive health. In other words, our health system is designed that when you break, we fix you. It is not designed for how about we invest our money so you don't get broke. And to a certain degree, that's the kind of reaction I've had mm. to your presentation today, and I just wanted to give you some feedback. Mm. The other big point that just struck me is the value of senior defence officers coming out and working in this way. Yes. Mm. Can, I, can I comment that another policy issue is, well, can we ever get defence to take people who come from industry into a senior defence position. I mean, you know, Chris, if you were a, a defence executive, would anyone in defence ever allow you to become a colonel in, in headquarters second division? In other words, does it have to be a one-way solution rather than a two-way yeah. solution? So look, what, what I've tried to react to you is, I'm sure you've sat there thinking, oh, I love that map, or I can see that's a great picture of a seahawk or, or whatever it was. I was trying to give you some of the the big picture long-term issues that Chris raised for me, because one of the roles of RUSI is to promote that discussion mm. and develop an understanding of it out into the community. And I was reacting in those terms more than the, you know, the precise detail. But could I just go back and remind you that in the United States, it was actually the Clinton administration who began the research programs that suggest now what government should do is to set policy, evaluate, but let other people deliver. 
and to a certain degree as a taxpayer, I've grown up from an expectation that the government ran the post office, the rails, the roads, the hospitals, and now I live in a, in a place where I say, well, the government might control some of them, but I just go to that private health hospital yep. or equivalent to round it off. I just found that extremely stimulating. I hope you did as well. I hope that that will lead to... I'm going to talk to our, one of our vice patrons, the CEO of Talis, uh, uh, and say, you better watch that. Yep. Because Talis would be heavily invested in the kinds of things that Chris has raised for us today. Mm. Could you join with me in thanking Chris very much? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One of my delightful ah. tasks is to offer Chris a, a membership of RUSI, and we thank you very much thank for that. Thank you very, very much. We have a, a blinding array of ties. You can have red or blue. I've I, I got, I got, I got to go red. <laughs> and I didn't know whether the blue might tempt you a little. Could we get you to sign our visitors book before you go? And once again, thank you so much. Thank you thank very you much. Sir. Thank you, everybody. I'll just sign the book. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks. I've just got a couple of very, very quick uh, things that I'd like to just remind you of, of what's coming. Could I thank you for being with us? Could I point out what is about to come in the sense of our next series of programs? Um, firstly, there's a visit very soon. If you would like to book in, we have organised a visit. We did it about three years ago, I think. So we've done a repeat visit or organised a repeat visit to the Historic Aircraft Restoration Society at Albion Park. The details are in our flyer. We can give them to you later. But it's on the 15th of June, and basically you book in through the Haas website. We hope that you could... Uh, and uh, I counted up the airframes. We've got 23 ex-Royal Australian Air Force air airframes that there at the moment, many of them flying. And we've got X9 uh, ex-fleet uh, air arm airframes, a number of them flying, the, uh, the Tracker and the Iroquois. Could I invite you to be with us again here on the 29th of June, which is a Tuesday. And could I just point out to you very quickly the logic of why we've asked um, Neville Tompkins to speak. Have you ever seen the advertising for Qantas when it was actually operating a lot of aircraft? i put that quite deliberately. And it would say to you, do you want to be a Qantas pilot? Well, don't even come and talk to us until you've got 200 hours of private pilot's licence and the following qualifications, and then we might like to talk to you. So can I point out that a very important long-term policy in building resilience is what do we require, request or encourage our young people to do? And I made the point last time, have you ever seen the Australian story with Mike Cannon Brooks talking about why he became an Atlassian co-founder and a million billionaire? And he said it was Pennant Hill Scout Group. Have a look at that Australian story. And by the way, I said to Scouts, he's just given you a million dollars worth of marketing. You better use it. So Scouts did their resilience study and we've invited Neville if he would come and share with us. Can I remind you that if you want to get into ADFA, then you could be offered a Year 11 scholarship and that encourages you, doesn't it? So this is raising what do we do with younger people to bring and build resilience and that's the purpose of that one. And then of course a much more classic topic for RUSI, the new head of the Cyber Division has agreed to speak and so Major General Susan Coyle will be our guest speaker on Tuesday the 27th of July. And can I remind you that the largest division of the PLA is the Cyber Warfare Division. So can I urge you to see that as a very important update. We'd like to again thank you so much for supporting us today. Could we ask that if you don't have to rush, come over and have a look at the Library of National Significance, buy all of Greg's books, etc, uh, etc. Et and seriously, if you haven't had a look around this new Anzac Memorial Extension, please do so. It's very moving and very appropriate. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you.